Uh, great to be here, folks. Um, I drove up in very warm weather with my windows open. I don't have any air conditioning in my vehicle, so it was uh, just sort of like a, a lurch into summer all of a sudden. Um, as, uh, as John indicated, I'm a writer. I write for In the Hills magazine, which is an acclaimed uh, regional magazine that serves all of Dufferin County, Cremor, Erin, and to the south in uh, Caledon. And I've written uh, for them since uh, 2001. And uh, every article I've written is about nature. I'm, I'm a dyed in the wool naturalist, have been since I was a little boy, never lost the fascination. Uh, every year I find new things to be fascinated about. So I'm not only into salamanders, I'm into just about anything that uh, we find out in the natural world. Really nice to hear about the snake sightings today. I'm uh, very much a herptologist. Um, I'm also a tree guy and coming up on uh, Highway 10, Highway 6, seeing the magnificent American elms along roadside. Uh, just wonderful. I've, I've uh, loved those trees for decades and decades. So nice to see that they're still there. Nice too to be uh, here in the cusp of uh, the Bruce Peninsula, one of my favorite uh, parts of Ontario for obvious reasons. Um, and I, I passed by the, the book table out here on my way in um, and uh, saw that very soon you're going to have an updated version of the, uh, the orchid book. Uh, kudos on that, wonderful. Um, I also commented to the lady, sorry, I don't know your name, Audrey, that on my bookshelf is uh, the old guide to the ferns uh, written, I believe, by Nils Mahar. And in fact, I went on a hike with Mr. Mahar, I'm thinking maybe 20, 25 years ago, and he showed me not only ferns, but orchids as well. So uh, that's my sort of tenuous connection with your club in this area. Um, we're going to jump right into things, and I'm, I'm just hoping that this works. Yeah, yeah, the lights down, it'd be great. Okay, so I need help from John because Brian, I, Brian, sorry, Brian. <laughs> Brian and John and Audrey, okay. That was me manually doing it. Sure. Okay, so I want to go back, and it should conceivably start automatically. Hey, eh? this is a video. Oh, I think maybe I need to hit a little W. Yeah, there's only about four videos all told, uh, Brian. So, okay, we don't have any audio, but um, this is what's happening right now, well, when the sun goes down. Thanks. So uh, most of what you're seeing are male spotted salamanders. And uh, if you hit the right night, uh, the right pool, uh, you'll find these amazing copulatory swarms. So the salamander right in the center has just deposited a spermatophore. That little mushroom-like uh, white structure is uh, filled with his sperm. And he's hoping, of course, that a female, and there's, there's going to be one or two females at least in that mix, is going to take that spermatophore into her cloaca to fertilize her eggs. So it's no touch sex that these uh, salamanders uh, engage in. Um, the, but the male salamanders get tremendously excited uh, in the presence of a female, and this is what, uh, what you see. Uh, purely nocturnal creatures, uh, they come to the ponds for perhaps two weeks. There's a little bit of window in the, uh, in the spring. In my area, it uh, generally starts uh, late March 
and then carries on. There's another one depositing in a spermatophore. Um, and then generally goes through to just after mid April. Uh, it got started late this year. We had a cold uh, March, which uh, set the uh, salamanders back a little bit. But as of last Wednesday, when in, in North Halton, we had a day that was about seven degrees, uh, but constant rain that uh, summoned the salamanders to the ponds. And so many that when you go to a pond on a night like that, you need to be very, very conscious of the fact that you might step on one. You need to uh, use your flashlight and walk slowly. So that, that's a challenge on a really good night like last Wednesday. Um, I don't know if it would have been, it, it, your climate is probably similar because you're right by the lake. Uh, I bet that was a good night up in this area as well. Uh, but there's probably still one or two prime nights yet to come. And if we get rain on uh, Sunday, as predicted, uh, that could well be a very good night for salamanders in this uh, part of Ontario. Uh, not a, I, I don't want to uh, throw a lot of text at you, but there are a few terms that um, uh, I'd like you to be aware of. And I apologize to anybody who already is very well versed in this sort of thing. Uh, so the spotted salamanders are in the Ambistoma genus, and that genus, uh, the colloquial name for that genus is mole salamanders. Um, aptly named because most of these uh, Ambistoma salamanders spend most of their time underneath the ground. They're subterranean creatures. Uh, coming out, uh, of course, at this time of year, uh, there's, uh, they come out in the fall after rains, uh, to walk the forest floor, but primarily underground. Uh, in my area uh, of Halton, the Jefferson salamander uh, is found. And uh, that my part of the Niagara Escarpment is the epicenter for this uh, endangered animal uh, in Ontario. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the Jefferson salamander later on. Very wide ranging in Ontario is uh, Another Ambistoma species, the blue spotted salamander, a lovely little salamander, maybe about the length of my index finger. Um, and all three of those salamanders do very well if they have a vernal pool to breed in. They were once called vernal pool obligate species, indicating that they need those vernal pools to breed in. Without the vernal pools, they will. Uh, they simply will not exist. However, I think more aptly, they could be called uh, fishless pool uh, obligate species because the best pond that I go to and the one that I'll visit on the way home from Owen Sound tonight is a permanent pond without any fish. Uh, fish, of course, will feed ravenously on their eggs and the larva. Uh, so vernal pools right now look like this. This is a a pool on 15 side road, uh, Halton County. Uh, we were there last week um, carrying the salamanders from one side of the road to the other. Had about a dozen people out. I'd like to see that more organized in years to come. In hot spots, uh, try to help the, uh, the amphibians cross the road. Vernal pools, as you're likely aware, generally dry up over the course of the season. Shallow ones will dry up uh, obviously earlier than uh, deeper ones. Deeper ones that uh, might be about 140, 150 centimeters deep at this time of year may last until late July, early August. The occasional vernal pool might not dry up uh, in a given year at all uh, um, if, it's, uh, if there's some reasonable rain. Um, there are, if, if the salamanders aren't precisely vernal pool obligate species, uh, there are invertebrates and other vertebrates that certainly are vernal pool obligate species. Um, one of them is the, the wood frog. And uh, if you are fortunate to live in the countryside uh, up here in the Owen Sound area, you have a patch of woods and a pool, um, you'll undoubtedly hear the quacking of, uh, of the wood frog. Uh, when I was a child, I thought uh, they were ducks. And I, I would go and I would look and I would look and I could not figure out why I was not seeing the ducks. Um, those are wood frog eggs there, by the way. And uh, a signature uh, vernal pool obligate 
um, invertebrate uh, are the, the fairy shrimp. Uh, just an extraordinarily beautiful little creature, uh, about a quarter of an inch long or a centimeter long. And uh, they swim on their backs. And if you, uh, uh, it, it seems to be just a banner year for fairy shrimp and vernal pools down my way. If you shine a light into the water at night, swarms and swarms of them will appear in the light. They're attracted like moths are uh, to lights. So habitat needs are, uh, are fairly basic. Um, if you do not have adequate forest, you will not have these salamanders. It's just as simple as that. They're not meadow species. Uh, they're not brushland species. They're forest denizens. So forest is, is uh, completely necessary. And again, as I indicated earlier, fishless ponds are the other part of the equation. Take away one or the other, the salamanders cannot exist. Uh, so spotted salamander is a featured salamander today. And um, this is a, a, a small sampling of uh, spotted salamanders. Found a lot um, a week or so ago crossing the snow. They're incredibly hardy creatures. Uh, on their way to get to the ponds. Some spotted salamanders are not spotted very much at all, like this one. There's tremendous variability in the, uh, in the spotting uh, patterns. Uh, something I've been doing at my favored um, fishless pond uh, in the springtime, and I'm, I'm doing it again this year, is taking pictures of the heads of spotted salamanders that arrive at the pond, um, because as indicated here, uh, they're um, absolutely unique to every salamander. So conceivably, um, if I knew what to do, uh, you know, computer-wise, I could compare from year to year to year uh, to find out whether uh, uh, how long salamanders are living, uh, whether they're coming back uh, to that particular part of the pond. Maybe somebody eventually can figure out how to do that with the information that uh, I've collected. But that is a really unique feature of these salamanders, not shared by the Jeffersons or the blue spotted or any of the other salamanders that live in this part of the world. So the males and the females, rather easy to tell apart, at least at this time of year. Uh, the males are generally more slender, uh, as you can see in the image, and they have an enlarged dual organ dual excretory reproductive organ called a cloaca. And uh, you can see this just by standing above them and, and shining your flashlight. Uh, female, um, and they, they seem to generally come a little bit after the males. I saw many, many females last night and the night before at this pond. Um, they're, they're generally very chubby. Uh, uh, as they arrive at the pond, uh, and uh, presumably that's because they're distended with eggs. So it, it, it's a magical time at, at a, a spotted salamander pond uh, uh, when you're there at the right time. And this is uh, a similar aggregation to the one that I showed at the onset of the presentation. Uh, looking from above, you can see that it's raining. These uh, salamanders worship the rain. I mean, they, uh, they're, they're just simply more active whenever it's uh, raining. Uh, when they're actively breeding, and that means after dark for these creatures, they will come periodically to the surface of the water to get a breath of air. So these are all lung, uh, these are all salamanders with lungs. And um, uh, you can, uh, appreciate that as they're expending the energy involved in reproduction, they need to take more breaths of air. Intriguingly, you can go to the pond in the daytime and not see a single salamander. So you might have seen thousands of salamanders the night before. During the day, nothing. They're hiding under the debris at the bottom of the pond, the detritus, and uh, they don't seem to need air at that point. So they'll uh, be the entire day. Um, without rising for a breath of air. At least I have never seen one rise during the day. A uh, little bit of fun now, perhaps, um, not for the uh, salamanders involved, but uh, uh, copular, clop, copulatory miscues. Uh, wood frogs start to breed a little bit after the, the spotted salamanders arrive at the pond. The salamanders come first. 
wood frogs secondarily. And um, wood frogs, like so many other frog species, are tremendously motivated to get the job done uh, when they arrive at the ponds. Uh, and I don't blame them for this at all. You know, consider that a wood frog, if, if lucky, might live three years. You know, they're, they're preyed upon by so many things. And then they have this tiny, tiny window of activity in the spring, the tiny opportunity to pass the genes on to the next generation. So they grab all sorts of things. And in this case, uh, you can see a spotted salamander embedded in the, the wood frog mass. Um, when I was at the pond for perhaps 45 minutes on this particular night, this is a, another pond, a vernal pool, and uh, the, the mass just continued to engulf the uh, spotted salamander. Um, I've been asked by some people, why didn't you reach down, break it up? Well, that, that's, it's not really my place. Uh, you know, this, this, uh, this happens. This is, uh, um, you know, a part of the natural scheme of things. Uh, pickerel frogs, like wood frogs, uh, very interested in anything moves in, in the ponds. And uh, this one was uh, firmly grasping a uh, spotted salamander female. Uh, she tried to shake him off by rising, swimming down. Uh, there's absolutely no way um, he was he was there for the duration. So I, I mentioned spermatophores before, and and again, the, this is what they look like. And uh, you can determine whether you have spotted salamanders in your pond, even if you don't go out at night. So this time of year, you'd go to the pond and you'd look down on the uh, the leaves and the pond bottom and if you see these white globs, then you know that you have spotted salamanders breeding in your pond or the, the uh, spermatophores, uh, about a quarter of an inch in height. Yeah, so they're, they're not very big, but they're, they're uh, very, very obvious. Uh, curiously, the Jefferson salamanders that breed with or breed in the same ponds as uh, spotted salamanders, do not seem to leave obvious spermatophores. I haven't figured that out yet, um, but uh, if they are depositing spermatophores, they must be um, transparent. They certainly don't show up like the spotted salamander uh, spermatophores. Uh, then of course the egg laying occurs and uh, in egg laying, the females uh, wrap their rear legs around a support, in this case a stick. Uh, stick over here as well. And then they extrude the eggs out of their cloaca. So by this time, uh, they've presumably taken a spermatophore uh, into, into their cloaca. Uh, their eggs are fertilized. And these are uh, spotted salamander eggs. This is not obviously the production of a single salamander. This would be several salamanders. And uh, spotted salamander eggs, once you get to know them, are really very distinctive. And I'll, I'll show you a comparison between these and frog eggs and, and Jefferson salamander eggs uh, uh, in a moment. But they're, to me, they're just, they're beautiful things. Um, some of the egg masses uh, are opaque, as you can see here. That does not mean that they're uh, diseased. It, the, in every population, there seems to be a certain percentage of spotted salamander eggs that are opaque. And uh, there's been various theories advanced as to why that is the case. Some suggestion that the opaque eggs work better in, in certain, according to the productivity of the pond. Uh, I believe if, if the pond is high productivity, the um, opaque eggs will yield larva that will do better low productivity, the normal eggs will uh, work better, uh, but I don't think it's uh, really uh, fully understood. Uh, the eggs, of course, are uh, full of protein, and uh, uh, it's not surprising that they're fed on by uh, a variety of creatures, and uh, caddisfly larvae, for example, will often be seen feeding on egg masses, uh, caddisflies, by the way, could be an entirely uh, other uh, presentation. Absolutely fascinating. They are remarkable in that, and I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but every species of caddisfly builds a different type of house. 
uh, using different types of material, even if there's abundant other material around, they'll select the material that they are um, programmed to choose. So uh, here's just one variety of uh, caddis fly house, if you will. Um, in the big pond that I go to, medicinal leeches are very common. Uh, they'll feed on eggs as well. And then um, this is rather intriguing as well. Just got a sip of water here. So this is a spotted salamander egg mass, and uh, you can perceive algae within it. Um, Scientists, biologists have known for decades and decades that uh, spotted salamander egg masses have algae. So, but the big revelation came only recently, and it was by a Canadian uh, in uh, Nova Scotia, that there is a symbiotic relationship going on between the salamander larva and the algae. Not only that, this algae has only been found associated with spotted salamanders. So it is, the algae appears to be utterly, completely dependent on spotted salamanders. Spotted salamander goes, it goes. So it's co-evolved with the spotted salamanders to the degree that uh, the, the algae cysts inhabit the body of male and female spotted salamanders. And then when the reproductive act occurs, some of those cysts are extruded and with photosynthesis start to grow uh, in the egg mass. So it's a, a fascinating, fascinating relationship, never being observed uh, in any other vertebrate on earth, this uh, symbiotic relationship between an algae and a vertebrate. There's certainly invertebrate algae associations uh, uh, out there, but uh, not vertebrate algae uh, as far as we know. Uh, so really interesting, the algae presumably um, give the uh, developing uh, embryos oxygen, and then the algae in turn feeds on the waste products, the nitrogen uh, and, and other um, uh, chemical constituents that the, uh, the larva uh, give off. So that's what a uh, ambistoma salamander looks like. And I don't have this labeled as Jefferson or uh, blue spotted or spotted because they are all very similar. I can't tell them apart, uh, but they have very prominent external gills that you can see here. They're uh, rapacious ambush predators. So they'll wait at the bottom of the pond and any small creature, fairy shrimp, for example, that swims in front of their uh, heads, uh, they may inhale. Um, they Juveniles look like this. So when they metamorphosize, you can still see the vestiges of uh, gills right here. Um, when they metamorphosize, they don't have the discrete spotted pattern yet. I'm not sure when that occurs, maybe over the course of the winter time. A uh, little bit of a story here, and uh, I don't know if I um, am interpreting this, uh, this story precisely but um, last or two years ago we found uh, this female spotted salamander coming to the pond with mites uh, all over her uh, torso and particularly her head and um, here's my hypothesis and you know you might think I'm all wet that's that's fine and uh, you can tell me your hypothesis maybe but and this is another intriguing story burying beetles like this one, typically carry mites. And they have a, uh, a relationship with those mites. So the burying beetle acts as transport for the mites. And of course, burying beetles are looking for carcasses. They're looking for little dead animals to lay their eggs on. So they go, they find, say, a mouse. The mites, allegedly, according to what I've read, jump off the burying beetle and uh, uh, go on to the mouse, and the mites feed on fly larvae. So flies, of course, are attracted to carcasses as well. They lay their eggs in the carcasses. Uh, they hatch into little maggots, as you're aware. That's what the mites are after. So they help the burying beetle 
by decreasing the competition. So the bearing beetle lays its eggs in the mouse and its larvae feed on the mouse and the mites help those larval bearing beetles uh, because they knock down the fly larva. Quite an intriguing story. But getting back to the salamander, so what, I've, what I'm guessing might have happened was that the spotted salamander encountered a burying beetle on the way to the pond and ingested the burying beetle. And as it was struggling with the burying beetle, presumably the mites left the burying beetle. They knew that the jig was up and they had nothing to do but clamber atop the, uh, the spotted salamander. Now they're going to get a shock, obviously, when the spotted salamander arrives at the pond, and uh, you know they, they're not aquatic uh, critters, of course. So that's that's my hypothesis. Uh, lots and lots of parasitism at the pond that I, uh, the big pond that I go to, uh, leeches. We'll go back for a moment, and um, the leeches almost always adhere to the armpits, the leg pits of the salamanders. I have no idea why that's the case, but that's typically where you'll find them. And uh, there seems to be a variety of leeches that do that. I always wonder what happens to the leeches when the salamanders inevitably leave the pond. Uh, do, they, do the leeches know enough to drop off or do they uh, go along for the ride and eventually uh, perish? Um, the cell, it, it, I, I wonder about this with my friends every single year. You see hundreds, maybe even thousands of salamanders at a pond, um, but very rarely do we see any evidence of predation. Um, it is known that spotted salamanders, in fact, almost all spotted salamanders have toxic skin, and that toxicity varies from salamander to salamander. Um, so that has to be part of, that's probably part of the reason that we don't see too much predation happening. Uh, but I do see some, uh, I've come across a number of tales of spotted salamanders over the years. And uh, from what I've read, the tails contain a higher concentration of toxins than the rest of the body. So it could be that a, a raccoon or a skunk or a fox is eating the body of the salamander and discarding the tail. Um, snakes, uh, at, like the garter snakes that uh, we were talking about earlier, um, seem to have a built-in ability to detoxify um, amphibians. Um, think of a hognose snake uh, that uh, lives almost primarily in American toads, which are very, very toxic animals. Uh, a story that came to me from uh, Jim Bogart, who is a professor emeritus at the University of Guelph, who is the foremost uh, expert on uh, Jefferson salamanders. Uh, he had uh, a tracking study going on down in, in Halton County to find out how far Jefferson salamanders walk. And of course, that is critically important because that part of Ontario, maybe up here too, is uh, pockmarked by quarries and uh, more and more quarry activity seems to be um, in the works. So they want to know how far these Jefferson salamanders travel. So they put little pit tags in them. And um, one of his researchers was out one day and uh, tracking and she was really, really puzzled because the salamander was moving far too fast for a salamander. And it was sprinting across the forest floor, it seemed. And uh, she eventually caught up to a garter snake, took it back to her lab at the University of Guelph, and it excreted the pit tag eventually. So garter snakes will eat these animals. Uh, that is undoubtedly one of the reasons that they are nocturnal. And of course, another reason they're nocturnal is that they're very prone to desiccation. Um, they'll, they'll certainly dry up during the day. Uh, a really neat study came out of Algonquin Park only very recently, and I uh, have to give credit to a gentleman named uh, Patrick Moldawan. Um, and they keep track of a fabulous spotted salamander lake in Algonquin Park called Bat Lake. Now, Bat Lake is highly acidic. It's so acidic 
that fish cannot live in it. However, that sets up really excellent habitat for the salamanders. Presumably the salamanders are uh, much less prone to the acidity. So they have thousands and thousands of spotted salamanders breeding in Bat Lake. Only recently uh, they discovered that uh, metamorphs leaving um, presumably Bat Lake were ending up in pitcher plants. And uh, a really, I'll go back here. Uh, it's just a fascinating uh, number of them were, were uh, ending up in pitcher plants. 20% of the pitcher plants in this bog had uh, spotted salamander metamorphs, so newly metamorphosized salamanders within their pitchers. And of course, the end for those uh, um, salamanders is, uh, is a fairly miserable one. Uh, so the morphology of Jefferson salamanders, spotted salamanders, uh, after being out in the field with these for so many years, uh, I can, I mean, obviously you look for the spots, but you can get spotted salamanders as indicated earlier that do not have very many spots. So there are differences in uh, morphology. The Jeffersons are generally a little thinner. Uh, they have a more laterally compressed tail that presumably helps them to swim when they're there in the, uh, the ponds. Um, and the head of the spotted salamander is a little broader than the Jefferson's. Now I'm about to confuse myself yet again, and uh, that means that I'll probably confuse most people in the, uh, in the audience. So I'll, I'll try to abbreviate <laughs> this, uh, uh, abbreviate my talk in the unisexual uh, salamanders that are, are part of uh, the Jefferson blue spotted mix in the province of Ontario. It is utterly fascinating. Uh, what I do know is that uh, these to me look like um, pure Jefferson salamanders. This looks to me like a pure-blooded uh, blue-spotted salamander. This is almost undoubtedly a unisexual that has genes from both. But I'm not even uh, supposed to designate these at, definitely as Jefferson salamanders because according to the research, um, you don't know it's a Jefferson salamander just by looking at it. There is uh, a tremendous number of these unisexuals that look similar to the adult blue spotted or the adult Jefferson salamanders. They are all female. They all contain genetic mixes, at least in, in this part of Ontario, uh, of the blue spotted and Jefferson salamanders. And they are characterized by Jim Bogart at the University of Guelph as sexual parasites. And I'll try to explain that. So the unisexuals, again, are all females. They come to the same ponds that the pure-blooded salamanders come to. And they take, they must be stimulated. Uh, their reproduction must be stimulated by a pure-blooded Jefferson salamander or a pure-blooded blue-spotted salamander but they almost never incorporate any of his genetic material in the production of their eggs. So what they end up doing is just simply cloning themselves, identical clones. And uh, it's not right to call them hybrids. It's not as if Jefferson and Blue Spot had come to ponds and, um, and mix up their genes uh, in the way we, we normally understand hybridization. This has been going on for about 2 million years apparently. And in the United States, you get combinations of tiger salamander, Jefferson salamander, blue spotted salamander, spotted uh, smallmouth salamander, all in the same organism, all in the same creature. So this even throws our ideas of speciation into a, a tizzy. It is a really bizarre situation that's still poorly understood. Um, so I, I think I better I better leave it at that. Um, I, I will say that there's one pond near Guelph that 
Jim Bogard has been monitoring. And he extrapolates that eventually all the Jefferson and unisexuals will be gone from that pond because the unisexual females are dominating. And uh, eventually the males are going to die out and that will send the unisexuals into oblivion as well. Um, if you want to dive into that story, there's lots of uh, information on the web and maybe you'll be able to uh, explain it to me after, uh, after you figure it out. Uh, there's, I'm not going to go through all this. <laughs> uh, see if there's anything that I missed. Now we'll leave it at that. So I'm still going to call it, uh, um, for the sake of simplicity, Jefferson Salamander. This could be the uh, one of the unisexuals. Uh, this is their egg lane. And um, I'll show you the difference between, uh, these are Jefferson Salamander eggs. So you've, you can remember the spotted salamander eggs I showed you earlier. Jefferson salamander eggs are really, really easy to distinguish from uh, spotted salamander eggs. Uh, there's um, real obvious differences. And one of the differences is that Jefferson salamander eggs are always aligned linear linearly along the supports, usually a, a stick like you see here and here. So that's one uh, difference and I'll get to another difference or two in a moment. Um, some of the ponds in the Halton region are thick with uh, Jefferson salamander egg masses right now. Um, they were coming to a pond in, in Peel that I go to way back in March. And in fact, one year I found them breeding February 27. So they're really, really early breeders. They'll breed long before you ever hear a frog. Uh, they can tolerate temperatures that are just very modestly above zero on the way to the pond. They can get into a pond that is almost completely covered with ice as long as there's a little fringe along the, the, the edge and that's where they'll uh, do their reproductive activity. So this picture was taken late April uh, a couple of years ago and you can see just the, the sheer number of egg masses uh, in this particular pond. All of these are, are Jefferson salamander. And we have another video. I'm hoping that it will work or Brian might need to get it started. Oh, it's gonna work, Brian. So just a tour of a, underneath a, a vernal pool. Again, Jefferson salamander eggs. You might see the odd fairy shrimp. So it's really quite a treat to uh, peer underwater and, and see what's happening. I, I use a uh, little Olympus tough camera on a hockey stick, either that or a paint stick for, for greater distance. So that's in Halton region in the uh, Speyside area. Um, so Jefferson salamander eggs, uh, the, most of the eggs that you see there are affected by mold. And the uh, theory uh, promoted by, uh, again, Jim Bogart is that uh, these are likely unisexual eggs. So the unisexual eggs are not as uh, viable as uh, pure-blooded uh, Jefferson salamander or blue-spotted salamander eggs. Um, I'm also intrigued that many Jefferson salamander eggs that I see also have uh, algae within the egg masses. And I wonder if something similar, some sort of reciprocity uh, is occurring with Jefferson salamander eggs and algae as it is with uh, uh, the spotted salamanders. So, uh, Jefferson salamanders will lay eggs so very early that uh, they're often laying them under the ice 
And uh, when that ice melts, the pond level can often drop, leaving many of their eggs high and dry. Uh, it can happen with spotted salamander eggs as well, or it could just be a, a particularly dry spring uh, and uh, water levels uh, will uh, decrease rapidly and leave them stranded. These eggs spotted here, Jefferson's here, are still viable. So they will be able to survive for a while uh, outside uh, the, uh, the water uh, protected uh, by the, the, uh, the egg mass. Uh, so what I do when I come across these, just simply break the uh, twigs and let the eggs drop into the water. So as, as the slide says, a springtime egg uh, primer. Um, wood frogs are laying eggs right now and uh, they typically lay great masses of eggs. They do it communally. Um, and uh, this would be the production of many female wood frogs. Uh, it is thought that by uh, concentrating the eggs in that fashion, they create a microhabitat in the pond, uh, which soaks up more heat. So they, each individual egg is black and uh, that, um, helps increase the ambient temperature of the egg mass uh, and accelerates the development of the, uh, the eggs. So up here, wood frogs and spotted salamanders, you can see that they're profoundly different. Uh, wood frogs manage to pack far more eggs per cubic centimeter uh, than the uh, spotted salamanders do. Spotted salamanders eggs uh, always have this very distinctive membrane surrounding each embryo. And that is uh, just an excellent way to distinguish them from the Jefferson salamander eggs that you see here. And again, there's that linear uh, uh, feature of the Jefferson salamander eggs along the support. Spotted salamander eggs are more globular. Uh, pickerel frogs will be uh, breeding soon and, and they lay um, egg masses that are somewhat similar to the wood frog. Uh, and again, you can see the hundreds, if not thousands of eggs in this egg mass compared with uh, maybe just scores of eggs with the spotted salamander um, egg mass of the same size. Um, Jefferson salamander eggs here, spotted salamander eggs here and here and here. And now we're, we're approaching the end of my presentation, but I'll, I'll show you a few more salamanders that uh, occur in this area. Uh, most of you are familiar with the red spotted newt and uh, this too is a video. So it's working. So the, the male red spotted newt is right here on top of the female and the, the male newt holds the female right behind her head with his rather Popeye-like back legs. And then he periodically waves the tail. And presumably what he's doing there is flushing pheromones towards the snout of the female to get her in the mood. And this goes on for, can go on for hours. I, I've seen this happen when I didn't have my, flat, or my camera with me driven home about 20 minutes away, back to the pond and found them still clasped like this. Um, it doesn't appear that the female enjoys it very much, but uh, that's anth anthropomorphizing, right? And then he tries the other side. And the shake you see is, is because I'm holding the camera without any support and, you know, someday I'll wise up and put it on a uh, tripod. Uh, the red eft, of course, is the um, immature uh, red spotted newt. And uh, this is uh, a really, really cool animal uh, in, in a variety of different ways. Uh, so these uh, are not sexually mature. They live on land, according to the literature, for two, three, four years. And then they turn green, grow a bigger tail, 
and go back to live in the water for their balance of their life. So what the red spotted newt is doing here is partitioning the habitat. So they, the red Fs get to roam the forest floor and, and avail themselves of all the choice morsels and vertebrates found there. The adults get to um, feed uh, in, in the ponds. Um, red Fs are toxic creatures. Uh, any, and and many of you know this. Uh, anytime you find a tiny animal that is brightly colored, brightly colored orange and red in particular, you can almost bet that it is toxic. So think of a monarch butterfly. Monarch butterfly is advertising to the birds uh, that uh, you know you'll you'll be sorry if you try to eat me. So the red eft is doing the same thing, and this allows the red eft to be a little bit more out in the open, so to speak, than other salamander species. It'll come out during the day, uh, if it's a, an overcast day in particular, a little bit of rain, and go for a wander. Um, there is a relative on the uh, uh, west coast of uh, North America, British Columbia, down into uh, California, uh, Pacific Nude, I think it is, that is extremely toxic. So, um, so toxic that it can, can kill human beings. And there, there's stories, perhaps apocryphal. One story is uh, about a group of young men who went camping and uh, they, uh, they put a, a kettle on the fire uh, and had their tea and then not realizing that there was a, a newt inside the kettle. A newt had climbed in and all three of them died. Um, another story about a... a, a a young man who on a dare swallowed one of these newts and uh, very quickly su succumbed. So the toxin that the red Fs have and the Pacific newts as well is uh, tetrodotoxin. I, I've probably got, uh, butchered that, but it's the same toxin that the puffer fish have. The puffer fish that, you know, fugu chefs in Japan have to be specially trained uh, to cut out the toxic parts of the puffer fish before they feed it to their clientele, otherwise the clientele will die. Um, the, the same toxin is found in these uh, uh, red Fs. Uh, it's actually called excellent. Okay. Tetrodotoxin. Tetrodotoxin. Thanks for the help. Um, so these have enough to kill, say, a shrew a mouse, a small mammal, but, uh, but not us. Uh, redback salamander is the most common salamander here in the Owen Sound area. And in fact, throughout much of Eastern North America, um, it is, uh, it's thrown off the shackles of, of having to go back to ponds to breed. It breeds on land. Uh, they lay eggs and rotten logs and under rocks and that sort of thing. Females protect the eggs. Uh, they're lungless, unlike the spotted Jefferson blue spotted salamanders. These creatures do not have lungs and they absorb oxygen through their skin. So they are utterly, completely dependent on moisture for their survival. Uh, you won't find them underneath a, a rock or a log, even in the forest, if it's been dry, if there's been a drought, they're going to be underground. That's the only way that they can, can live. When it rains, uh, especially at night and in, in uh, late summer, early fall, they come up to the surface on mass. Uh, that's the best time to look for them. I don't necessarily like finding them by flipping things, uh, but if you go out, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about this uh, momentarily, if you go out, uh, say, the, towards the end of September, early October, uh, after a day of rain with a flashlight into the woods, you're almost certain to see uh, redback salamanders. Uh, this is a juvenile. Some of them uh, have the red backed form, or sorry, the lead backed form. Uh, there's a small percentage of every population that uh, uh, appear like this. They can lose their tails readily, and that, of course, is a predator uh, deterrence. Uh, the tails continue to writhe like uh, the tails of some um, lizards. Uh, the blue, the, the five line skink here in Ontario, for example, will readily lose its tail as well. And 
uh, it was only maybe five years ago when I started going out after dark uh, in late summer, as I just uh, described, that I, I uh, found out the redback salamanders are climbers. They are big time climbers. So uh, typically it is only on small, I shouldn't say only, but typically it's on uh, low lying herbaceous plants, things like zigzag goldenrod. Um, but they will also venture up branches, the sides of trees. This one was up 80 centimeters in height. Um, sometimes they will uh, be found climbing with, uh, obviously there's no association between the two, but this is happenstance. Red Fs will climb to a degree as well. Uh, so really intriguing. And, and I have three hypotheses uh, regarding this. And again, they might all be wrong. Um, number one, they breed in the fall and they breed on land, not in the water. So this could assist pheromone dispersal. There's hypothesis number one. So get yourself off the uh, forest floor where it's quite still and into some air currents for pheromone dispersal. That's number one. Number two is um, they could be foraging. They could find uh, uh, good eats uh, off the ground. I, I have trouble with that one though because you think that there's all sorts of little invertebrates down in the leaf litter that they could easily, more easily access. And uh, theory number three has to do with our friends, the spotted salamanders. So at that time of year, spotted salamanders will also rise above the ground uh, after a day of rain. And uh, as mentioned earlier, they're, they're larvae are voracious predators. So too are the adults. And red back salamanders are the perfect size to be eaten by a spotted salamander. So theory number three is that the red back salamanders are getting themselves off the ground to avoid predation. Um, I very seldom, if ever, see these salamanders off the ground. Uh, another brief video, and um, I was delighted uh, only two years ago, I think, to uh, uh, go to a stream near Guelph. I got a tip from a, a kind gentleman out there that there might be mud puppies. And uh, so I saw my very first live mud puppy. I found dead ones down Lake Erie way. Um, since that time, I found them in a stream in Halton as well. They're very widely dispersed. They're certainly up here. They're in Georgian Bay um, and well up into Northern Ontario across to uh, Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba. Um, the largest salamander that we have, uh, they uh, go through their lives, their entire lives with gills. So uh, they don't have lungs and uh, they are purely aquatic, um, very difficult to see because uh, they're aquatic, number one. Number two, they hide under rocks during the day. Number three, they're nocturnal. You know, they, they're only really active after dark. Let's see what happens here. We we'll just see it walking. They're fairly slow moving creatures. This is in, uh, I believe it was early December of this year, of last year. Just, just such a delight uh, to discover that they're, they're in a stream that I've visited all my life. And it, it took going out after dark to, uh, to locate them. What do they eat? Uh, good question. So they'll eat uh, uh, crayfish. Crayfish are a big diet uh, item. Um, presumably the, the various invertebrates, the larval invertebrates that shelter under rocks in the stream. Uh, they're not fast enough, in my estimation, to catch fish. They can be uh, very maximum length, 18 inches. Um, try 45 centimeters, uh, for those of you who think metric. Um, the ones that I saw were more like 10 inches in length, 11 maybe. But a real cool critter. Uh, just to close out the presentation, I got to tell you about uh, Calvin. And uh, Calvin has disappointed me this year because he has not shown himself. I'm going back there, as I say, after I, I leave you guys tonight. 
keeping my fingers crossed that Calvin might have appeared. Um, Calvin is a leucistic or a piebald salamander. Leucis, I can't say that word. Piebald creatures are uh, common in, uh, uh, relatively common in uh, the natural world. All sorts of vertebrates, birds. Uh, uh, there's examples of uh, piebald animals, leucistic animals. Um, it's a uh, fault in the ability of the uh, epidermal cells to uh, produce pigment in certain parts of the body. The wonderful thing about, I, I know of six of these from this pond, uh, they're all completely individualistic. So you look at one, you know what you've got. Um, the last uh, few years, I've just found Calvin, except for this, about uh, a week ago, I found uh, Edward. And Edward hasn't been photographed since 2018. So Calvin was first photographed uh, by Charlotte Cox, Credit Valley Conservation, way back in 2010. I was laggardly. I didn't find him until 2017. Uh, he was photographed 2019, as you can see here. Uh, Ryan Wolf, uh, the amazing blue racer guy from Peely Island, uh, he came with me and March 29th, 2020, we found him. Uh, he was still in the pond April 17th, 2020. So that gives you an idea of how long they might stay at a pond based on uh, Calvin's experience. And then last year, I, uh, or 2021, I got him on April 10th. And then last year, April 11th. Um, and this past year, I uh, found a leucistic larval spotted salamander. I can only keep my fingers crossed that eventually uh, he will come back. They're all he's so far, something to do with the genetics that uh, he will come back uh, as an adult two or three years from now. Um, this is really, really fascinating. It, it gives you an idea of how long live they are for one thing and, and how on earth does a, a small soft bodied slow moving creature live for, in this case, this is about 14 years. If you, it probably more than that, uh, at least two years to become an adult. So he was born, so to speak, at least in 2008. Uh, how do they live? How do they live so long uh, without being preyed upon? Um, but there's other fascinating aspects to this, uh, this story as well. Calvin comes to the same, this, the pond that I go to is maybe an acre and a half, two acres in size. It's a big pond. He shows up in an area like an area rug that you might have in your living room. It, that, that is his spot. He has never been seen anywhere else around the perimeter of that huge pond, just that spot. So from all, all of these years, that's where that, those pictures were taken. So I put it to you, and I have no uh, great hypotheses on this one. How on earth do they, how do they find their way to the pond? Now, that part we might understand through, you know, the, what we know about salmon finding their natal stream and following the chemical cues. Uh, so they might be doing that to get to the pond, but how does it find its way back to precisely the spot that it was the last year? Um, what mechanisms come into play there? It just boggles the mind. Calvin might travel 500 meters to get there. Maybe maybe a kilometer, you know? Uh, uh, the Jefferson Salamanders and Jim Bogart study uh, uh, up to a kilometer, maybe more than that. So I leave you with that, um, that final puzzle. And uh, that's about it. I do have an upcoming, you're a little removed from Guelph, <laughs> but uh, uh, I do a Guelph Arboretum uh, pond workshop uh, virtual on uh, April 20th. And uh, the virtual, I think, is 10 bucks. And uh, then I'm going to uh, lead an in-person workshop on the Saturday for, uh, and that one is $55. Um, my book uh, is Nature Where We Live. I have some here today. Uh, I am a very poor marketer. I hate talking about myself in that regard, but uh, uh, 
I guess I've got to do it. Um, uh, they're, uh, they sell for uh, $20. And what this is, is a sort of a compendium of activities that you can do in your local area, not exotic places like uh, Tanzania or um, Tucson, Arizona or whatever, but things that you can do in sometimes just in your own backyard or at least in the, uh, the closest uh, natural area. And uh, that will be all. Thank you. Do you want to take questions? Sure. Yeah. I'll just put what's on. Sorry about that. Um, so Don's open to any questions if there are some from the floor. Monica? Uh, this would be my third year. Can you just get the question into the mic so the the um, Zoom people here, they're not picking that. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so the question was, how many uh, years have I been have I been taking uh, headshots of the spotted salamanders? About three. This is my third year doing it, and I hope to be able to continue that. And uh, like I say, eventually find somebody who can, you know, uh, fiddle with them on a computer and, and compare them from year to year to year. <laughs> Maybe Brian. Uh, yes, sir. They're more fully formed. Yeah. So they'll kind of, they'll emerge with little tiny, tiny legs. Um, and for the Zoom people, the question was uh, when uh, uh, salamander larvae uh, emerge from their uh, eggs, are, do they look like frog tadpoles or are they more fully formed? They're more fully formed. And in fact, they're born with um, balancers. So two projections that sort of come out of the, the throat area. And uh, they're called balancers perhaps because they help the the little larval salamanders swim, but I don't know if that's uh, verified or not. Yes, sir. Uh, the question was, uh, how many eggs does a spotted salamander produce, spotted salamander female, and, and what the survival rate is? Uh, the literature suggests about 200 eggs, and they'll lay that not in a single egg mass, but uh, a few different egg masses. Uh, there's probably great variability. Uh, as for the survival, um, with spotted salamander eggs, uh, uh, from my observations, most of them do survive. They, they make it to larval hood, I think it's uh, during their larval hood where a great deal of predation takes place because of course they're sharing the ponds with uh, dragonfly larvae, diving beetle larvae, lots of other crit critters that will eat them. Yeah. Yes, sir. If you're surveying an area of a pond about the size of a little how, how do you cover that whole area without getting your feet wet? Uh, the question was, uh, if I'm surveying a large pond, uh, how do I uh, cover the area without getting my feet wet? Well, I wear chest waders. <laughs> and uh, so I, I pretty well go where I want to go. But I, I got to say, I'm, I'm careful because they can be under the leaf litter. You know, I shuffle my feet. I don't go rampaging into a pond, it, generally just the periphery of it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there was one of my slides. The question is the wood frog that was, uh, or wood frogs actually that were grasping the salamander, what was it doing? Uh, they are programmed to mate at this time of year. So they have made a mistake. And, uh, when I was a, a little boy and I knew nothing about sex, you know, I didn't learn about sex until I was 30 or something. Um, I would walk around, I had a little pond uh, behind my backyard. I'd walk around with American toads 
on my wrist. And I thought that the American toad liked me. It was making friends with me. But uh, uh, so it, they, it, it's amazing that they're not a little bit more discriminatory. They're, they're not able to discriminate very well. Uh, they'll grasp all sorts of uh, things, inanimate objects as well as uh, living creatures. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the medicinal leech. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there, later on, there was another leech. So that you named, and you didn't call it a medicinal leech. Are these the ones that they actually use medically to uh, uh, sanitize our yeah, uh, so the question is about leeches and medicinal leeches uh, in particular. Uh, yes, the medicinal leeches, uh, I believe, are the ones that are used uh, in uh, health settings. I don't know if that still happens. Uh, does it? Okay. Uh, to um, uh, basically reduce the swelling around a, an injury, that sort of thing, to engorge themselves with blood. Um, Saw that on uh, Call the Midwife. Uh, if you, if you, if you had, are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Uh, that seemed to work very, very quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, that that is why they're called medicinal leeches. And then there's just a whole host of other leeches that are also found in the pond. I had somebody from some universities in one year say, why don't you collect these leeches? I never have. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I'm intrigued again that they're on the salamanders in the pond. What happens when the salamanders leave? So, yeah. Yes, sir. How long is the egg stage and the nymph stage? Uh, the question was, how long is the egg stage and nymph stage? The egg stage uh, varies according to the temperature of the pond. But, uh, a, you know, a very rough guesstimate is about a month. And uh, then the larval stage will be two or three months. And that brings up something I didn't talk about. Because so many of these creatures use vernal pools, there's a real big trade-off here, isn't there? So they're not going to be preyed upon by fish, but of course that vernal pool might dry before the larvae ever have a chance to metamorphosize. And that is a significant, uh, uh, that can be a significant problem. Last year we had a drought during the summer. So, um, Many of the shallow vernal pools with salamander eggs uh, that I visit, uh, those salamanders did not make it. Uh, so the, the cycles of weather uh, is one variable uh, as well as the depth of the vernal pool. Um, ideally, you want the vernal pool to last until the end of July. That might be it. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Don, on behalf of the Owen Sound Field Naturalist for your thank terrific you. talk this evening and uh, your fascinating remarks and photographs. Look at us lots to think about and look for on future hikes and walks. So thank you very, thank much, you very much, Steve. Thank you.